Hey, welcome back. Billy here, Gym City Welding. Uh, spring, perfect, perfect day. I actually stayed home from work today because I've got a ton of work to do. I've got a um, quite a big job coming up for a customer doing some welding and fabrication. So I'm getting prepared for that. Um, but I also had a, a couple things that I had to get done today that uh, I have not shown on the channel. So I'll uh, go ahead and show you guys those now. So yeah, a couple changes. Uh, first things first, got the springs in. Finally uh, bit the bullet and put those bad boys in. I've got the cylinder sleeves marked out. Sorry, cylinder holes marked out. That's kind of just like a rough, a rough uh, estimate there. Um, those of you that have asked cylinders and coils and, and whatnot, three and three quarter ton whites. And then I'm going to be running eight inch Cool cars, uh, these are their standard cylinders. Uh, they're fully TIG welded, uh, just absolutely amazing pieces. But uh, these measure at an inch and five eighths um, OD, and I'm actually going to be sleeving these holes. So basically what I've done is I've got inch and five eighths uh, ID that will fit those cylinders. And then I'm going to sleeve the hole for actual two inch uh, fat stick cylinder. Um, they're a competition cylinder that CCE, excuse me, Cool Cars offers. So yeah, I've got basically everything to do that job now. Um, some of you may ask, why would you bother sleeving it for larger holes if you're running the inch and five eighths? Well, the, the answer to that is a simple one. Um, I'm not building this vehicle for a, as a competition vehicle like uh, as far as hopping goes but if if i ever want to change over to those two inch fat sticks i will already have done all the work and all it's basically just a, a change of cylinder and i want to do that now that way you know a year two years five years ten years uh, down the road i don't go oh i wish i would have done it you know the other way around so and you never know, maybe I'll throw a set of fat sticks in here and uh, let this thing fly. So we'll, we'll see someday, I don't know. I'm not there, I'm just planning ahead. And um, so I got all the materials for that stuff today, uh, which was incredibly cheap, went to my local steel yard. It's like 60 cents a pound right now. So steel's come down quite a bit, it was a dollar. Geez, it seems like back in October, November, a dollar a pound. Uh, and that's, of course, that's recycled steel. Um, so if you're not hip to that, call your local steel yard, ask them about drops, ask them about recycled steel, blah, blah, blah. I've talked about it on the channel, enough of that. Uh, do want to give a really quick shout out. So let me can flip this thing around here. Let's see. To the adventure. Of course, a commercial. I'll bring it back when I can skip it. Um, made some other changes. As you can see, motor trans is sitting in the frame. Uh, we've already we've already shown that on the channel. Can I skip this? Yes. Goosey Fab Fabrication. Guys. Merchandise stores now open. Guys, if you're not hip to Goosey Fabrication, get hip. Find his channel on YouTube. If you're an Impala guy, a lowrider guy, or just a body guy in general, this guy is a master craftsman. He is the freaking man when it comes to these Impalas and the stuff that he's showing. And the amount of de you know attention to detail that he shows when his filming, um, you can learn so much from this guy. He he seems like a great guy to talk to, and uh, we've we've had a couple words before, just back and forth. He and I on on YouTube, and uh, he's a very nice guy. So he's he's amazing. So Goosey Fabrication, gallon and a quart. Look him up. But let's get back to what I was talking about. Motor trans in a frame, okay? My buddy um, has access to a sandblaster and he hit me up and he said, hey bro, now's the time to sandblast some parts if you want to blast some parts. So I pulled valve covers and take off basically anything that I could unbolt minus the uh, harmonic balancer. I got to get a puller for that uh, because uh, this these 327s are internally balanced, so it uses a really tiny balancer that takes a, a three bolt pattern there, and I've got to get a puller for it. You don't want to put like a jaw 
puller on this because this piece of rubber that's between here will come apart. We don't we don't want to do that. So I got to get the correct puller. But anyways, strip this thing down to pretty much everything that I need to paint minus the you know water pump block heads, which I'll have to clean. Um, and speaking of clean, yeah, guys, that is clean. Yeah, of course, gaskets got to be changed. RTV, you know, that kind of stuff. But I mean, like, there's no, there's there's just a teeny tiny little bit of something there, but it's, man, this thing is so clean. And something I wanted to point out to you guys that have these early Impalas, if you're keeping the 283 or 327, be careful about this, this crankcase ventilation stuff. Um, it, it uses a can on the inside that is like an evaporator evap can i don't know how else to describe it i don't even know if that's the technical name but you get the idea be careful of those um this particular car has a road draft tube and uh bear with me i'll be right back sorry had a phone call come in so like i said has a uh has a road draft tube and basically what that does is that circulates uh the um uh, crankcase pressure through the intake the air cleaner uh, back into the block and this system was primarily used on like I don't know if it was 455 but most definitely 55 to 60 probably mid 60s somewhere in the mid 60s uh, the early ones actually just vented right to the ground the tube the tube would literally <laughs> would literally just run down the block and then drip oil onto the ground um, this particular intake uses this kind of breather system so there you go, that goes on the oil fill tube, which goes on the front of the intake itself. Um, so just keep that in mind if you have one of those early setups. But I took all these parts, got them blasted the best I could. I uh, have not done the air cleaner yet because that's, to the best of my knowledge, that's OG paint. And it probably will clean up really well. So I think I'm gonna try and preserve that. But the rest of this stuff, had some nicks and scratches and stuff like that. Valve covers obviously need redone. Uh, pulleys, that sort of thing. Um, this is that tube I was telling you guys about. Bolts to the back of the block here. This portion uses a rubber hose that runs up to the back of the air cleaner. And that circulates all the crankcase pressure. So, that's that. Um, it's kind of out of order because... Like I was saying on an earlier video, my goal is to get this chassis underneath that body so I can get this thing jacked up and measure for the convertible mounts. And uh, as you can see, or hopefully you can see, I've cleaned out underneath the car quite a bit. Enough room, hopefully, to slide this chassis underneath very, very, very soon. But this opportunity... You know, I had to uh, I had to jump on it because it's just it's one of those things. It's one less it's one less part of the project that I have to complete at some point by getting all that stuff blasted. So that's that. Cylinder holes we talked about that pretty straightforward. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Uh, but the other thing with this video is, bam, there it is, CPP baby, uh, 500 steering box, all the uh, front like uh, not sway bar, but center link. Um, that finally came in today, as a matter of fact. This is the original power steering stuff, which is no longer needed. I've tried to give this stuff away and I, I just can't find a good home for it. It's, it's not that it's bad, it's just, uh, it's at this point, it's obsolete. So with that being said, I started mocking up tie rods. As you can see there, there to there. So I'm going to have to do a unboxing here and open up the center link and show you guys that part and show you guys the power steering box. Um, that will be later on in this video. I'm actually, I got to cut this short and uh, come back to it a little bit later on. I got some plans this afternoon that I got to get to. Oh, by the way, intake. Not perfect, but it'll get the job done. It's a hell of a lot cleaner than it was. And that's that oil fill too I was telling you guys about. Um, so, with that being said, I will be back 
I don't know how soon, and I'll do the full unboxing for the CPP 500. So stick with me on that, and um, hopefully by the end of this video, I, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth when it comes to this kind of stuff, but hopefully by the end of this video, I'll have the chassis under the body. Fingers crossed, um, but if not, I'll get it on the next video. This is just a, a want to be a quick update for everyone as to where I'm at with the project. So it's going to be a little while for me, but just a second for you. So I'll see you guys later. Take care. All right, here we go. So welcome back. Uh, it's next day. Uh, got the CPP stuff here. We're going to go over. I'm sure that's uh, what everybody wants to know. I'll post a pic of the kit that I bought. This was from Speedway Motors. Um, the kit, I think with shipping or shipping was free with tax and everything. It was like 560 and that's to my door. Um, so what I'll do, I've actually already opened these because, uh, of course you want to check stuff out immediately in case you're missing, excuse me, missing something or got to send something back. So I'll go ahead and show you the parts that I got now. Um, two packages from, from, uh, Speedway. I believe these were directly from CPP, but I could be wrong about that. I have to look at the uh, paperwork that came with it. So, first box will be Pitman Arm. So, this is, a, I believe this is a manual Pitman Arm. Comes with a cotter pin here in the bag. So, I'll show you that. Looks like a really nice quality piece. Everything's uh, burr free and everything looks really nice. So, fitment arm. So, and it's got the cotter pin and grease fitting for the uh, joint here in the box. Uh, next package in the box would be. Okay, so this looks to be 50, it says 61 to 64. Chevy full size and 63 to 66 Chevy truck idler arm. So, those of you who may not be familiar with the CPP 500 kit, basically what's what you're doing is you're taking your factory, your factory Impala front power steering stuff if your car happens to be a power steering car, and you're converting it over to all modern um, steering application. The, the Man, it's used as a manual center link, I believe a manual pitman arm. Um, 59 and 60, I believe, use an adapter for the for the frame, but we'll, we'll go through the kit here before I start bolting stuff on. But um, basically what happens is, guys will get these cars, and if they're a power steering car, um, they'll, you know, sometimes, most all, often than not, they need rebuilt, especially if you're making a low rider where something's bouncing up and down. You're gonna get leaks um, and so I priced like part for part kit this kit versus rebuilding the whole complete stock front suspension and ultimately I decided that dollar for dollar it was better to get this kit for one because it's cheaper in, in a lot of ways Two, um, I don't have the hassle of worrying about leaks not not to say that this system can't leak just simply it's it's eliminating a lot of uh, potential for leaks and this is like a, almost like a quick ratio steering. Uh, it's like 14 to one and it's, it's a all modern, you know, components, brand new components. Um, idle lower arm comes with the kit. As you can see, pretty nice quality. It's also got a uh, cotter pin, grease fittings, uh, two bolts that bolt it to the frame. And then this little adapter block. I, like I said, I believe that's for 59 and 60s but I'll have to cross reference to make sure I don't need it on this frame. I, sh I shouldn't need it on this frame. So that's the second bag in the box. And then, let's see, this should be the manual center link. Yes, that's what this is. Manual center link. Um, because the power steering one's different and it won't work with this uh, with this type of CPP setup. Now, I don't know 
I don't know if you can use like say one from Rock Auto or a, even a manual car. I, I'm sorry, I just didn't do the research that far into it to find out if you can use those parts. I looked at it like, okay, I'm gonna get a kit. This is what I'm gonna need. And I'll just get it all at once. So there's your manual center link. Pretty straightforward. Um, again, nice quality, pretty nice paint, nice finish on everything. So I believe that's box one. So that has uh, three items in box one. Um, make sure this isn't something that might just be packaging. Yeah, it's just packaging in the box. So the next thing, of course, like I said, I had to, I had to open this ahead of time to make sure everything was complete. So disclaimer, not a true unboxing but you get the idea. So it comes with instructions on how to install everything. Um, the, only, the, what, the one thing this kit is missing is like your, um, how you're gonna connect it to your steering box, either with a uh, rag joint, a coupler, um, a couple steering knuckles, one at the top, one at the bottom with like a, a D shaft steering shaft. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do this. I'm not totally solidified in how I'm going to do that just yet but that decision will be coming soon once I start putting everything together here. Uh, first thing out of the box, mounting hardware. Uh, take note, when you, when you convert over to CPP, you have to drill out the bolt holes for a 7 16 bolt. And so I've already pre-drilled these holes. I did that earlier today before I started this whole thing. Um, it barely, barely takes any other material away when you go to do that. So it's, uh, it's don't get the idea that you're going to be in here like hogging out holes. It's just, it's not like that. It's, uh, it took me 30 seconds to do all three holes. So just keep that in mind. You will have to open those holes up. So get yourself a 7 16 drill bit if you do not have one. Mounting bolts. Washer loose here. And then of course, the main part of the kit, which is heavy as hell. Brand new CPP steering box. Um, CPP no longer sells the uh, polished cover with this kit. Not exactly sure why they don't do that, but the idea, now I'll, I'll bring the camera in closer, show you guys here in just a minute cover on it so this is manual sorry power steering CPP 500 box um, again right off the bat looks like very nice quality um, it's got uh, 500 series stamped on the side it does have this cover which I guess you know you could polish this if you really wanted to um, totally up to the builder and then it's got your uh, pressure and your return or whichever one I'm, I can't remember off the top of my head which is which um, and then it's got where you connect your steering shaft to and then also where you connect connect your pitman arm to so pretty straightforward um, I can already tell you right off the top I'm gonna have to get a bigger socket or a bigger wrench because I don't believe I have one that fits that probably could use an adjustable but I'd rather I think the instructions recommend that you use an impact um, when putting that portion on so I'll source one of those but overall from what I'm seeing here everything looks really really nice good quality it is covered in oil probably from to keep it from rusting during shipping um, but yeah, so that's it. That's, that's the big deal, uh, with this particular video is, um, you guys who are up to date on where I'm at with the chassis and the frame and stuff like that. I've been able to roll the frame back and forth pretty good. But the problem is as soon as I ro roll it forward, the wheels either want to go like this or right or left. It, it, you know, I need something to connect the steering. Plus I need to check the clearance on the front of the frame and, uh, 
you know, I'm sure I'm going to get the question. What do you do if you have a uh, fully reinforced frame or a fully reinforced belly? How do you make this work? So there's a couple different ways. Um, and just because I choose to do mine a certain way doesn't mean that you, the viewer, have to with your project. Of course, different strokes for different folks. You know, no, no harm, no foul. But this is the way I'm going to do it. Um, the first way is you can notch the belly, the front plate, and recess that back. That's okay. That's guys do that all the time. Um, it's a, it's a bit of work, you know. But it's like anything else. It, you know, it just takes work. Um, so that's that's way number one. That way, when you recess that plate, you're, what you're doing is you're creating clearance for your tie rods. That way they don't interact with the frame when you're turning left and right. Uh, the second method, and this is the method that I think I'm going with, is what you can do is you can actually take and straighten this bar about 3 sixteenths. You know, it's, we're just talking ever so slightly on this bend. And take up that gap from where the frame is because of that plate that you put on. Um, and then, of course, you just take the turns out of your uh, tie rods. Take a couple turns out of your tie rods to make up for that straightening of the bar. Um, something else you can do that will work together with that method is you can buy a tapered reamer, which I will show a picture of that. And you can actually ream these uh, to set in deeper so it brings them closer to the bar. Now, the, re you know, the, the result of doing that, though, is now you've, you're uh, sticking out further with your nut and your cotter pin. So you may have to use um, a washer or two to take up that gap, screw on that nut and put that cotter pin, that castle nut, put the cotter pin through it. Um, so again, there's a couple different ways you can do this. I chose this method because um, it's been rec recommended to me by several builders who um, build these frames quite often. and. Uh, it just seemed like the best route for me. So again, whichever way you decide, that is entirely up to you. Um, but there are a couple different methods. So we'll, uh, we'll go through that together over the next video or two. Today, uh, just for the sake of time, I'm going to bolt this on the frame. Uh, I'm going to bolt some of these suspension parts up and just kind of see where I'm, you know, how things look clearance wise and then go from there. So if you have any questions about the CPP 500, um, let me know. I'll do the best I can. And... Okay, so here's the result of that installation. And as you can see, it's not exactly what I would call a square to the frame. It's, uh, it's offset on purpose, but the mounts are angled to take up that difference so keep that in mind when you're installing this thing and then of course those are just the three holes right there that you have to enlarge not that big of a deal um, and then in the instructions it talks about installing this kit with everything loose now I've seen a few guys do this stuff on YouTube and they um, they have a certain way in how they install all of these things but I believe you want uh, weight on the frame before you go tightening anything down um, don't quote me on that guys. It's just, uh, something in my brain's telling me I've read that somewhere before. So you get the idea. Set you back up. I'm going to try and bolt some of this, uh, some of these tie rods and linkages up. Of course, absolutely nothing right now is square. So I'm going to try and square that up a little bit and get everything installed. So here we go. Stay tuned for part two as we install the center link and show the modifications and the installation of that. 
Thank you for watching and subscribing.